So what I'm going to do is just go through some of the highlights of my time here in Bristol um, and what I've got out of the CDT in comms. So I actually came to Bristol way back in 2007. I did my only grad degree here. And I studied something called uh, computer systems engineering. Uh, and after about two years, the university decided to rename this as computer science and electronics because nobody outside of the university had any idea what computer systems engineering meant. I thoroughly enjoyed my four years I, I, stuck, I did it as, a, as an undergrad. And I realized at some point that I really, really wanted to make Bristol my home and I wanted to stay here. So me and some friends, without any idea what we were going to do next after our degrees, we decided to just get, start renting a house together and figure out what happened. Around that time uh, that we signed up for new property, the CDT and Commons was uh, finalised here at Bristol and it uh, was advertised and they were taking in their new students. So at the time uh, that this application happened, I was then balancing the application for my CDT, the CDT uh, my revision for fourth year, as well as uh, writing a student pantomime that I was taking to Edinburgh Fringe that summer. So, and actually, to be honest with you, the application, I nearly didn't bother submitting it yet. It kind of got put onto the back burner. And it was my dad that convinced me, you should, you know, what's the worst that can happen, you might as well try. And I'm really glad he convinced me just to put that application in in the end, because in the end, I wouldn't be here standing addressing you all as Dr. Barrett. After an insanely hot graduation in 2011, me, five years ago, uh, I started again as a PhD student again here in September. Now, the first is your taught year, which I enjoyed. I enjoyed the exams a lot less so. But what's nice about the kind of the, the CDT cohort that you, that, you, that you have in the first year is that there's an awful lot of different backgrounds and knowledge and experiences that you can draw upon. So I found the maths units the hardest because I didn't come from a, a, maths, a pure maths background. Um, but there were students there uh, who had come from a more math, mathematical background and they were able to help students like me who you know, found it harder to do this kind of things. And it went both ways, so some of the other things I could help them with. Uh, once you uh, pass the talk phase, you then move on to your research phase. And I chose a project with uh, BBC Research and Development. My uh, industrial uh, mentor to begin with was a guy called Peter Moss. He was involved in things to do with uh, amplifiers for the for digital broadcaster and fitters, wireless television cameras, on-channel repeaters for television and digital radio, cross polar MIMO, and he also helped define the DBB NGH standard. So, quite a lot of stuff there. Later on, he retired, and he was replaced by a guy called John Boyer, who helped do many things, but one of the key things of note was this half hour uh, HD UHD camera system. It was used on one show um, at one point, uh, like live on, on air, uh, and they've also used it now for uh, quite a lot of sporting events. This is a way of uh, being able to stream not, uh, un pretty much an uncompressed UH, uh, HD video back to central control within a, a building. Because having an industrial mentor, seeing you know, the work that these people do in R&D and actually taking them to a product and actually you know, providing you know, a uh, thing that's used in the real world is, is a great benefit to this kind of CBT structure where you have uh, industrial mentors. I also uh, got to visit the BBC a few times, which is pretty cool. My project was on adaptive uh, TV broadcast. And the idea of an adaptive TV broadcast system is you want to, you're trying to improve the energy efficiency of uh, broadcast TV. So at the moment what you basically do is you, you, you plan your network and you set it up and you run it and that's it, you leave it alone. You don't change it over time. And the, the, the thing with a digital television system, which we now have, is that it either works or doesn't work. It's a binary system. It's, it's on or off. So there's no benefit to the user for being 1 dB above the operational threshold or being 30 dB above the operational threshold. But because you don't know what's actually happening in, in real time, because the weather changes and so on, you have to err on the side of caution and you over-engineer the network. So the idea of an adaptive system is if the broadcaster knew what was uh, being received by user equipment that's sent by data going, I am here, this is what I'm receiving, the broadcaster could then adapt to this information and improve the energy efficiency of the network by changing coverage and so on. Uh, something I managed to do very early on was I was invited by Arkiva, they're the people that actually run the network, uh, to visit a broadcast tower. And so I think something you don't really understand unless you go to these places is just the sheer size of the operation involved. To put that into context, this is the list of the tallest man-made structures in the UK. And the Shah, which is the tallest building in Europe, is 10th on this list. Everything that's taller than the Shah, all mine of those things, are all TV broadcast towers. Uh, the tallest one is about 60 metres taller than the Shah. So these are massive, massive structures, really, really large. And the one I visited was uh, Sutton Coalfield, which is uh, just northeast of Birmingham. Now, this is actually quite a short tower, it's only 270 metres as opposed to 360 something. 
but it is the second most important tower in the UK in terms of the coverage, the people it covers after Crystal Palace uh, in London. It broadcasts at 200 kilowatts, it's responsible for 35 relay stations and it's approximately 10,000 square kilometres. This is what it looks like. Now, 200 kilowatts is an awful, awful lot of uh, broadcast power, which requires an awful lot of electricity. And it needs a lot of electricity because there's an awful lot of power amplifiers. Lots and lots and lots of power amplifiers. And because this is such an important site, each uh, multiplex, so channels are mixed together into one frequency, they actually have double, they, they have two sets of amplifiers going at the same time in case one fails. That's how important it is. So they've got double redundancy. So, uh, so these amplifiers are running and actually not technically broadcasting anything. It's in case something goes wrong, they can switch to it. So an awful lot of electricity is used. There's monitoring equipment for what's going on. An awful lot of cabling to get the timing right so the actual programs go out properly. An awful lot of cabling and ducting uh, and combining to bring all the signals together. That thing at the back which then sends up the tower to broadcast it over Birmingham. And this was a very interesting to see this. Uh, just to see, like, like I said, the scale of the engineering effort that's gone into building these things and like, what's going on. And just understanding the sheer, you know, the amount of electricity that is used in TV broadcast. The, the broadcast network in the UK takes up about as much electricity as the entirety of Southampton. That's how much electricity is used just to broadcast television. So, like I said, my work is trying to reduce, increase the energy efficiency of TV to just seeing you know, how relevant this could be to the network. It was extremely important very early on in my work. As part of my study, I was fortunate enough to spend two weeks uh, at the Polytechnic University in Valencia, Spain. This was taken as a uh, two-week secondment through cost IC1004. So this is just some simulation work that I did out there, uh, which was based on using this ICS planning tool, which is a, a TV planning tool. So I was able to take some of my work, put it into a uh, simulation environment, and see what you know would happen if I were to change, uh, you know, change the broadcast and how that would affect coverage. It was great for my PhD. The, the work was good. It went towards a conference paper, uh, and just you know, going to a foreign city, studying with um, other PhD students. Uh, other you know, supervisors and so on, which is a great, great opportunity. And we've got an awful lot of good links here with Bristol, investing with other city, uh, universities and other companies and so on. So if you have the opportunity to, to go and do a common, I'd highly recommend that you go ahead and do that. Uh, conferences. As a PhD student, you will definitely go on many conferences. Uh, the work that I did in Valencia, I presented here. I'm not joking, this is literally where I presented it. This is the University of Ghent in Belgium, which is a converted monastery by a canal. Conferences are very useful for you know, networking and talking to your peers, but you will go to some places that you never would have, you'd, you'd have dreamt you'd have gone to. Other places to, to know was uh, Ferrara in Italy, which is a beautiful medieval uh, town, uh, city I suppose, in, in the mid central of Italy. Dublin in Ireland, like, no year will be complete without the CDE conferences here in Bristol. This was from a few years ago at uh, the Emsha. You're always encouraged to go, try and attend as many as you can, they're great for networking and talking to your peers and just going to parts of the world you might not normally go to. Bringing it back uh, to Bristol again, uh, let's just talk about some of the toys and stuff that we have in the labs. You've already heard uh, the massive MIMO rig we've got, uh, Tom was talking about the Keyside millimeter wave stuff. Someone hasn't, we haven't mentioned these yet, can't really see so well in this picture, but these are the FA channel emulators. I was one of the first people in the lab to, to use these pieces of hardware. Uh, they're incredible. Uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, NI kits, so I use these NI USRPs with the work I did here and also to cap. Uh, Characterize live TV signals over time so I could take this information of what actually happens over a few days of uh, TV reception so I could model it, put it into my simulations and, and improve my, my work. With lots of hardware, we have lots of training. I've genuinely lost count of the amount of NI training courses I've been on. Don't mean that in a bad way, <laughs> but I've been on a lot of NI training courses. Uh, every year they won uh, an FPGA training course in Budapest. Also, I would like to mention the Technology Academy. I've uh, got good links there and usually they do an awful lot of good uh, talks. Uh, and usually they're free for students. So there are an awful lot of opportunities there uh, as part of going along uh, trying to get a PhD. And after all that work, four, four years of work, you, uh, you write a thesis, which ends up looking a lot smaller than you think it will, considering how much work you put into it. You then have an viva, which hopefully you pass. You then get to graduate, and you have the obligatory picture with your mum in front of the World Memorial Building, <laughs> the obligatory picture with one of your supervisors in MVB. You walk across the stage, shake hands with the dean, and they give you a nice piece of paper. So I'm actually uh, employed by the university as a research associate. Uh, so I moved away from the kind of TV work I've been doing into uh, characterizing uh, power amplifiers. And as was mentioned yesterday in uh, Chris's talk, this is something that's going to be very important towards 5G millimeter wave. 
especially when we go to much, much wider band bandwidths and how we're going to characterize the amplifiers over these wider bandwidths. The idea of digital pre-distortion on the left there is the blue curve is what the amplifier is doing to the signal. You can characterize that. You then do the inverse of that. You apply that to your um, input signal, and then the com combination of that and the amplifier, you get a nice linear response, which is much, much better. It's more efficient, and you have less of the spectral bleeding uh, into the sidebands, as well as it's easy for the receiver to uh, receive the information. Uh, the problem we're going to have, as was mentioned yesterday, is going to high frequencies, high bandwidths. Can we still do the same techniques? Are we able to observe uh, enough information over a wide enough, uh, window, in, uh, window of the signal to be able to characterize? So that's kind of what I'm doing now. So moving towards middleware 5G, going forward with amplifiers. Finally, uh, obviously, you don't do a PhD by yourself. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, my BBC supervisors, Peter Moss and John Boyer. Uh, so Narcis Cardona, David, uh, David Gomez Baquero, and everybody at uh, the University of Valencia, which made me feel extremely welcome there and helped me immensely with the work I did. Also, EPSRC. And finally, my supervisors, Mark, Andy, and Joe, plus all the lecturers, uh, over nine years now of being in Bristol who've helped me and given their time to help me over the years. Um, thank you very much. That's, that's it for me. <laughs>